Welcome to the NNLM Research Data Management Webinar Series August webinar. I'm so glad everyone could be here and join us today. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this session, Amanda Reinhardt. Prior to becoming a librarian, Amanda spent 11 years as a biologist with the USDA testing alternative agricultural methods to reduce the human impact on climate change. She draws extensively on this research experience while developing the library's research data management program. This program includes consultation services, workshops, development of educational materials, and teaching. She also administers Ohio State's DMPT tool software Software, which helps researchers create high-quality data management plans that meet funder requirements. Amanda received her MLIS from South Florida University, her MS in Botany and Plant Pathology from Michigan State University, and her BA in Biology from Kenyon State. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to Amanda's slides and give her control and ask her to get started. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'm happy to be here today and talking about uh, resistance to um, research data management. Um, so my title is Approaching Re Resistance to Change in Research Data Management. And I have an official agenda here. But what this really is is kind of the story of what I've observed and, and sort of tried to do and, and what I've learned in the last, I think I've been in this business about seven or eight years now. So um, the barest bones, briefest history of research data management will be there just for anyone who's just entering this conversation. And then I'm going to go on to a little bit of the research that's been done out there about researcher concerns and motivations, um, a little bit about some research that I've started to do using a framework that hopefully will help me and others understand this landscape, and then talking about sort of the techniques that I currently use to, to counteract some of the concerns um, that researchers have um, that prevent them from really moving forward. So I did ask that all the questions be held to the end, but that's really just because um, there tends to be a lot of people signed up at one time, but I tend to be a little bit of a, a quick talker, so <laughs> please feel free to, to ask all the questions you like. Um, I'm more than happy to go back to slides, and, and really I would encourage you to use the slides as sort of um, reference, because I don't cover everything in all the slides, and I put a lot of links in there uh, to sources in case you want to know more. So with no more further ado, um, hopefully most of you in the audience are familiar with this thing called a data management plan, but if you're not, this was sort of all kicked off around 2013 with the NIH when they came out with their data sharing policy and started to encourage researchers to really start to articulate how they were managing their research data, um, in particular the data that was being produced by their grants. By 2011, NSF and the NEH had jumped on board with this idea and started calling them data management plans. Then by 2013, um, there was a memo, memo that came out from the Office of Science and Technology Policy that really said if you're giving out grant funding, you need to start saying how you're sharing the results of the grants. And that really started to turn into this requirement to write up a data management plan. And you can see by 2015, like all the other government acronyms sort of jumped on board. So this is a fairly familiar thing now. Um, that most federal funders require, and even some of the private funders. So this plan really started to emphasize certain activities. Um, and this is sort of a, a, just a list of what most of the plans or some of the plans ask for, you know, backup, documentation, metadata, all this good stuff. It's all the stuff that underlies this ability or this idea that you're going to share your data set and somebody else might be able to reuse it. Even if you can't quite get there, there's still an expectation that you're going to organize it, you're going to store it, you're going to preserve it appropriately. So while these are all um, things that you would think or you would hope that people already do, the reality is a lot of researchers haven't ever run into this before, or they're doing parts of them really, really well, other parts not so well. Um, you hope that everybody's backing up their data, but you know, you still come across really high variability out there with researchers um, and understanding what the new expectations are and then being able to act on them appropriately. So a lot of my day-to-day -day work is, you know, 
interacting with a researcher or lab group or um, even at the college level kind of thing, trying to figure out what this group needs and then matching them or pairing them to the resources available. And resources are really, uh, they vary widely in between institutions and even in our, our very large institution. Um, one department might have great IT that has excellent storage, the next one not so much. So I just kind of listed some resources out there there that you know are very common to use. The DMP tool, which um, I administer, Sarah had mentioned that, and I think is a pretty common tool. It helps them write the data management plan, really use that as an educational hook to get them thinking about things. But a lot of times I also refer to other people, other experts, particularly in IT or preservation, um, running more and more into the need to refer people to legal counsel for ownership statements, patents, that kind of thing. And then, of course, uh, infrastructure is always an issue. Do we have the, the appropriate repositories and things? So in my day-to-day -day work, that's pretty much what I do, right? I talk to the researcher, I figure out what they need, I, I try and match them to a resource that helps them meet their need. Um, and as I'm doing this over the years, I would come across kind of small statements, um, not always well articulated. Some of them were as vague as, well, I don't know. No one would really want my data, so why am I doing this? Um, that kind of thing. And this all coalesced for me. I have kind of this one interaction in mind where this snapped into clarity for me. And I was, I was teaching a data organization workshop in 2015. And I teach uh, at the main libraries where I was teaching, and it's probably a good mile, two miles from the medical center. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not in the medical center realm. So for med center people to come up and, and listen to my stuff, they kind of have to walk a mile or two. Um, so I get a fair number of them. But there was this gentleman right at the front of the class, um, had sat through the entire workshop, mostly looking at his phone the whole time. Uh, and at the very end, he looks up to, at me and he says, I just don't believe in all this altruistic stuff. And it really was sort of took me aback because I'm I'm a librarian. It's entirely voluntary to come see me. I'm I'm sure there's lots of pressing issues in your life. Um, so to come and, and sit to a workshop to sort of push back on it was a little bit confusing to me and sort of helped to um, make me realize some of these other threads that I think were underlying conversations I had had uh, previously. And certainly he is not representative of most researchers. I think the very minority of researchers really feel that way or would express themselves that way. But it did start me really reflecting on where where does pushback come from, particularly when you're not, you know, I'm not representing the government per se anymore. It's not my mandate. Um, why would you come to a workshop to basically say you didn't believe in it? <laughs> so I started brainstorming about why the pushback, and I'm kind of a chatty person, so I talked to a lot of my colleagues, um, and this was kind of the, the list that we came up with. Uh, the top things that we thought might be uh, reasons why they weren't receptive to the information or they had frustrations were kind of the lack of knowledge the, or the lack of technology or of time or of money. Those were our top four things that I think we kind of assumed was behind some of this. And I think those are very reasonable concerns and certainly they do exist. But then, you know, once you get past some of those uh, easy low hanging fruit reasons, we thought, well, maybe there is some real validity to data not having validity or value or, or utility beyond the current use. And, and certainly in some very narrow areas, I think that can be true. Um, we kind of assume there's probably some concerns around misuse or abuse of data, maybe a little fear that somebody else is going to reanalyze your data and dispute your findings, um, the perpetual fear of being scooped, which is essentially when another researcher kind of gets to the conclusion before you do. So if you share your data, are they going to be able to analyze it faster and publish it faster than you do? And then sort of these list of concerns that I condensed into just ethical concerns, which can range all the way from you know, I want to protect my human subjects to is it fair to students to expose their data that way? Um, and, and those are, they get quite detailed. You know, you get into the weeds when you're talking about that kind of thing. And then last we thought, well, there's, there's a certain amount of people, um, particularly in like engineering and things, that really need to patent their data or have intellectual property concerns, commercialization concerns. So, so we kind of had this list going. Um, for a bit, and I wondered if we had any evidence, right, that would bring one or more of these to the top or, or if our assumptions were true. 
So, of course, the first thing I did is I started digging around in, in who had already done studies on researchers. And one of my favorite ones is actually done by the, the publisher Wiley. Um, they have surveyed their authors in 2014 and 2016. So this is over time. Uh, the first survey, they had about 2,250 people in the survey. The second one, about twice that. And they literally just asked them, what are your top data sharing concerns? And they have a list of options um, that the researcher can choose from. I, I will just tell you, even though it's not on this slide, um, lack of knowledge, time, and money are on this list, and none of those made it to the top five <laughs> for either year, which was incredibly surprising for me. Uh, what does top the list is the intellectual property uh, confidentiality concerns, and we've also seen an increase in concern um, over the two years here. So 50% of the respondents now cite this as their top data sharing concern. Uh, that itself was a little bit surprising to me. Um, the other element that's increasing over time, the other factor of concern is ethical ones. And again, those can be, uh, you know, parsing down into what exactly is meant by ethical concerns can be a little bit difficult, but I'm, it's interesting to see that one pop up too. Um, in 2014, it looked like whether a funder or an institution required data sharing was very important and pretty much it's disappeared off the concern list. Um, it's still there, but, but it's not ranked very highly at all now. And then there are consistent concerns around misinterpretation and misuse of data as well as being scooped. So um, one of the really nice things about the Wiley studies, beyond the fact that they have a large number of people that have responded, is they actually share all the data on Figshare so you can go in and pull it down and kind of do your own reanalysis, uh, pull out the groups that, that you find really interesting. So I, I thought, well, that's, I'm not sure I could do a lot about IP and confidentiality, but when we look at my list, kind of compared to what the Wiley uh, research says, it's really these uh, misuse, abuse of data, um, and legal concerns, um, it's sort of group norms, right? Misuse and abuse of data differs by what your group thinks, um, what they believe to be right. Uh, being scooped, again, what's ethical in that area, is really determined by uh, the competitive nature of your particular research area. So I was like, well, that's interesting. That's not at all what I had assumed, um, that it would be knowledge and you know more tangible resources like money and time. Um, there might be something here that's happening that uh, is kind of under the surface. So I didn't just search to see if anyone was looking at researchers' concerns. I was also interested in what motivates them to share before publication. So I was thinking maybe it's easier to approach this with a carrot than a stick, um, particularly since the government data management plan requirement can be preserved a little, perceived as a, a bit of a burden and a little bit more on the stick side. Um, so there was a, a lovely study done actually quite recently um, by a research group that looked at, I think, 27 different potential factors for what motivates researchers to share before they publish. And I should uh, put a little caveat in here. This isn't just shared data. This is to share any information about the research. So it could be a poster, an abstract. Um, so it's not exactly targeted on, but I think we can still have some takeaways from this. So what they found from the 7,000 some researchers that responded is that, again, it's the group norms, particularly defined as open exchange of information or the value of receiving feedback and acknowledgement. Um, competitive issues, again, that scooping or being first to publish, getting funding, um, being held in high esteem is apparently quite important, um, and worldwide competitors and commercialization issues, and we're back to kind of industry and patents and things, that these things actually drove 70% of the variation in their responses. So again, it was, it's sort of interesting to see that the motivations seem to be pairing very nicely with concerns, which does logically make sense. Um, and it's even more interesting to see that the number of things that really are kind of, they're group interactions, they're social, cultural, sort of local disciplinary um, effects that really you're not going to know going in, right? Like I'm not sure that I would know what the value of uh, feedback is or how feedback is valued in any particular research discipline except for the ones that I've been in. 
So one of the nice things about this particular study too is that you can, it does quite a lot of comparing of these disciplinary differences to pull out, um, you know, how they're different. And I, I'm not gonna present them all. It's, it's a fascinating study if you'd like to read it. Um, but I did think for this particular audience, clinical medicine researchers are, um, you know, very different apparently than basic medicine researchers and not coming from the health sciences side. You guys might already know this, but um, I don't. <laughs> so they, they essentially demonstrated that it's the competition factors that differentiate your clinical medicine researchers from your basic medicine researchers. Um, so even like within a community that seems like, at least from the outside, that it would be very similar in their motivations and concerns, um, there's some pretty big differences when you start looking at it from an empirical standpoint. So basically, what the research out there says, um, or what I pulled from it, is that researchers can have really complex concerns and they're often based around group norms as opposed to what um, I would consider more tangible resource restrictions. Um, so that's a different problem to tackle, right? When you're trying to make a connection with the researcher and get them to change their behavior. Uh, we also know that the concerns and motivations can differ by discipline and we're also seeing them change over time. So. Essentially, I'm not sure I solved anything by looking into this instead of I, I found a very complex landscape that looked um, rather daunting because <laughs> um, how can you uh, start to chip away at this problem? So I thought, well, what can I do? As a librarian, what can I do to help that gentleman in the front row not check out, to really engage with the information I'm giving them, to get him to a point or people like him to a point where they can start to, to um, listen and, and really start to change their behavior. And because I'm kind of chatty, I was talking to a colleague in the Department of Education about this and she happened to comment that this sounded a lot like what happens when public education has a mandate come down and says, well, now everybody's gonna teach to the test or whatever. Um, and that out of that, um, those experiences, trying to superintendents and principals trying to change their teachers' ways of doing things, there's actually a, a a framework that they use that's called the concerns-based adoption model. So this colleague and I, we've done a little work in this area and I'd like to present just a little bit of that sort of to um, explain kind of that there are tools, there are sort of systematic ways of getting to concerns and then approaching it in a scalable way. I think part of my difficulty uh, in the position that I have now is that there are quite a few researchers out there and there's not so many um, people that do the kind of work that I do. So sitting down one-on-one -on -one and, and really getting to the base of everybody's concerns isn't really a good model for approaching this. Um, so I'll present a little bit about the concerns-based adoption model and then really come back to what can you do now to leverage your existing skills that help in this area. They might not solve everything. I mean, certainly I don't have any magic, um, you know, the magic data wand that solves all the problems, but they might be worth consciously employing as you navigate this space. So this framework, this concerns-based adoption model, it's the analogy they present is that it's a bridge, right? You have a group of people who have one behavioral practice on one side of the bridge, and you want them to cross the bridge and change their behavior to wherever the desired be behavior is. Um, and so they fully admit change is hard, and the more entrenched and, and sort of uh, strongly held beliefs and attitudes there are, the, the harder it is. And um, they, of course, are approaching this from an education angle because this comes from the field of education. And what fascinated me is they actually believe that change is measurable and they've demonstrated that. So as people are you know, going across this bridge, so to speak, um, you can see where they're at and then you can change up your interventions for them, your educational processes or whatever you're going to do to try and help them based on their progress across this bridge. So this is kind of a complex model, um, or at least for me, I don't, um, my background is of course in agriculture. So um, 
this kind of work. It was a little new to me. So I'm just going to kind of go through what it is and what we did. But if you're really interesting, I would strongly recommend um, checking out the book Implementing Change, Patterns, Principles, and Potholes. They go much more in depth and, and can explain it quite a bit better probably than I can. Um, so the first thing you do when you're looking at this is you have to define what the new expectation is. And they call that the innovation. Um, but basically, the new expectation for our people is that they are now expected to perform all these activities related to research data management and possibly expected to share if they don't have a good reason not to. And the second part of it is you measure people's attitudes and beliefs. So basically, they're stages of concern. It's not actually asking what their concern is, but trying to get at where are they at in processing that concern. Um, are they actively working on it or, you know, kind of where they're at in the process of moving through change. And then lastly, they ask about what they're actually doing. So they try and get to be like, okay, you're self-reporting this attitude and belief, but what are you actually doing about it? And those surprisingly can be very, very different. <laughs> um, so based on this profile at the end that you, you score people out and you profile them, um, you can sort them into groups. And the idea is that then you can apply some kind of customized education intervention to that entire group. So again, it's not a real scalable model where I'm at to say I'm going to sit down with every single researcher and talk them through it. Um, it's much more of an idea that, hey, if I could get people to figure out where they're at or if I could figure out where they were at, we could all put them in a room together and have them go through an exercise that would help them move on to the next step. So what are these steps? Well, there's two scales basically involved here. The first, are, the first one's called stages of concern. And there's actually seven letters, but they do score them out this way, zero to six. And what it'll look like is um, sort of expressions of concern. So all the way from I'm not really aware that this exists and I'm not concerned about it, to how does this affect me again? Um, sounds like I need to know something about it. Uh, to, you know, how, how is this going to impact my career, right? And how do I collaborate with others doing it all the way up to how do I organize my community around this, right? So there's this idea that someone can be at any one of these stages um, and they might need a little help getting to the next one. Very similar looking, but kind of focused on activity and actual behavior as opposed to attitude and beliefs is the levels of use. So again, it starts with, I don't plan to manage my data, I don't have data, I'm not interested, uh, to I'm now prepared to start doing this, I kind of know some stuff about it, all the way up to doing it regularly, working with colleagues, and then of course I'm, I'm leading my field and, and implementing this change across my discipline. So that's just a really brief overview. As I said, it's a little bit more complex than I'm used to, um, just because I don't come from this background. Uh, but I did want to put up uh, a couple of caveats. It looks real neat on paper, but not everyone will go through all the stages. So, you know, humans are kind of a lot messier than our lovely spectrum, our scales there. Um, as well as expectations shift, and we know that they do, uh, some people are going to vacillate between stages or even possibly need to start over again. Uh, depending on their perceptions of how big the change has been. Uh, and then finally, some people may never accept the change. Uh, you can give them all the educational opportunities and knowledge and resources that you like, but there's a profile called the hostile non-user. And this profile is where someone demonstrates really high concerns around how the change is going to affect them and what the broader community is doing about it, but they're not real interest in actually doing anything about it. <laughs> so their actual activity around the change is very low, as well as um, any kind of beliefs or attitudes that they should embark upon finding out more. So um, I found the hostile non-user a fascinating profile. Obviously, it's a minority of people in most studies. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, what immediately occurred to me as I was reading this is, is that guy in the front row who just doesn't believe in it, is it possible he's just sort of considered the hostile non-user? that he doesn't know a whole lot about it, hasn't really done any of it, but he has very strong belief that this is not something he wants to do. So this colleague of mine, Kim Lytle, and I, we put together a little study just to see if we could take this framework and make it um, work around research data management. And particularly, we define it as planning for research data management, uh, mostly because when you look at all the activities under that, you can get um, little you could get quite deep in. So um, this is just sort of preliminary work, getting out there, checking it out. 
uh, the stages of concern, there's 35 questions that get modified to measure that. Levels of use, there's one. <laughs> um, and then we, we picked up some demographic questions as well, just because we were curious. Um, our goal was just to be able to sort participants into profiles. Uh, we just wanted to see if this particular framework could be transferable to this setting, to higher education, uh, to this kind of work. Uh, the goal of developing customized education for each profile group is a little beyond what we have resources to do right now, but we, we hope to get there in the future. So yes, what comes out of this is a survey instrument. It is 45 questions. That seems really long. Um, but the vast majority of the questions are Likert-like and they're patterned very similarly. So we actually found that it took less than 15 minutes for people to fill this out. Um, well, of course, we got IRB, IRB approval. Uh, we decided to use our, our postdocs as a good testing pool simply because we had some logic behind that that is early career people. Um, we, we estimated they'd come out as sort of the beginner profile in this space. Uh, so then we scored according to the protocol and we generated our profiles. And this is pretty much our outcome at this point. So we got 104 responses, but only 57 of them were complete. And that's probably because it is quite a lengthy, um, you know, 45 questions is a lot. We were a little surprised at our results. We have eight what we would call hostile non-users. That's a little higher than what we would have guessed at the postdoc level. Um, we also have another eight who are unaware or unconcerned about planning for research data management, which we thought postdocs would be far enough into their careers they would um, have a little bit more awareness about that. Um, we had some at the beginner level, a decent slice of them, but actually had more at intermediate level of uh, interaction with planning for research data management, which is a little higher than what we thought. And then we had one expert. And when you go back to the demographic questions, you see that even though he's a postdoc, he's got 20 years of research experience. So then that kind of explains why he, his profile comes out as an expert in this area. Um, he, and then we have six that we have yet to really be able to determine. Um, some of it's a subjective process of slotting them into profiles. So pretty much our conclusions at, around this at this point in time are that we do believe the instrument works, um, that we can differentiate and put people into groups. Um, we definitely need more t reliability validity tests. And honestly, most of our participants, for whatever reason, came from biological sciences. So we need a much larger sample size to make sure that this is a, a real phenomenon we're seeing here. And then hopefully in, in later years, we can um, move on to sort of demonstrating that if you can get a group of these people together at a certain stage and provide them with the information they need to move on to the next stage, that you can actually kind of move people forward in a scalable way. So that's some fascinating stuff that um, we're currently working on. However, I'm keenly aware that not everybody probably has the bandwidth or the interest to jump right on um, frameworks around change theory and, and do their own studies. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what do I do right now to leverage my existing skills to help reduce research or concern um, and to, to get past kind of some of the uh, underlying emotions that you can sometimes run into. And the very first thing that I would advocate and that I do is I'm the trusted librarian. Um, uh, there was an interesting small study came out that looked at a bunch of professions and just asked lay people, you know, do you trust this profession? And librarians come up number two in trustworthiness. Uh, I think we're beaten out by the nurses. But um, other than that, we, we already come in with kind of this uh, persona of being a trusted librarian. I do articulate it. I'll, when somebody asks me to look at their data management plan or um, invites me in to talk to the lab, I will say I'm completely confidential because I'm a librarian. And, and nine times out of ten, the response is, oh, oh, I'm not worried about that. And, and they sort of dismiss it, but I believe that it still does goes a little bit of way to say, hey, look, I'm ethical and I'm your ally. You don't have to worry about this. This is all going to be a very positive interaction. And this next one, I, I think we do not give enough credit for. So active listening. Um, a lot of times people are taught active listening is sort of, uh, or at least I've run into it in sort of HR contexts of we're doing professional development, that kind of thing. But I actually think this really parallels what you're taught in the reference interview. Um, I love this quote from Doug Larson that is, wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening 
when you'd have preferred to talk. <laughs> As you can probably tell from listening to me so far, I'm a bit of a chatty person. I generally do a lot of talking. Um, I found it much more beneficial if I kind of suppress that a little bit. I call it meeting them where they're at, right? So you, I just ask them, tell me about your research. I don't even limit it to data. You can start anywhere. I'm going to pull out bits along the way and ask questions. I'm going to build my credibility with them. If I don't know the answer, I'm not going to try and sell them on something that, that I don't think will actually work for them. Um, if I'm not the person to talk to, I'll just refer them on to who they should. A lot of times they get repeat business because of this. I think that even if they come to me with something that I can't help them with, if they have a positive interaction, they feel like they've been heard and not judged, um, they feel like I've accurately understood them, they'll come back again when they have another question. So I think this is actually um, tremendously undervalued in our profession, and I really emphasize it, particularly if I have people coming in new, that uh, it's very important to practice these skills rather intentionally. And the last bit here is really donor relationship skills. And I didn't realize this um, until I was talking with, again, colleagues of mine within the library. And one of them said, I think this was over lunch, and they were like, you know what this sounds like? This sounds like when I work with donors who are, you know, grieving that they are letting go of these collections or, you know, this was their mother's collection of material or, or whatever it is that has all these emotion under it. And there was actually a lovely article written about this. Um, and the quote from that article is, to remember that the anger and the frustration and the sadness that the donor may feel is not his or her fault, and it's best not to take these reactions personally. And when I heard this, I immediately came to mind this image, and this image that I have on the slide here, that I have taken, I, I took a picture of this years ago. It was a day of data at uh, Brown University, I believe, and there were all these researchers at the front talking about their data, and as the researchers talked about the data, if you were in the audience, you could have a visual reaction. So basically, you could draw out what you thought or write a quote or whatever, and it would be displayed up on a board. And this is one of them. And I took a picture of it thinking, this is the perfect um, encapsulation of the environment of data, research data in particular, that's rarely, if ever, articulated, right? So it's a gun. <laughs> it's a gun that shoots data. And from that, it shoots fear, sadness, love, happy angst. And I think keeping that in mind when you're working with someone can really go a long way to um, just provide context around maybe why they feel the need to, to come up to a workshop and then um, challenge sort of what the value of it is. So you have to kind of um, have a bit of empathy maybe with these people, because really data is terribly personal. I think these data sets are their, their very personal collections. So, so essentially, in summary, uh, basically what I tried to pull together here for you guys is that researchers are going to have resistance, not all of them by all means. I think that it's still a very minority of researchers that will, will do what that gentleman did um, when he kind of just came and, and then decided he didn't believe in any of it. Um, but I do think that researcher resistance to data management is due in part to concerns around group norms and ethics and emotions, um, their response to the new environment, as opposed to maybe lack of tangible resources, which are certainly a factor. Don't let me undermine that. But I find that they, they might need, or I suspect that they might need to get past some of these concerns around the group norms to even start investigating, you know, sort of what technology could help them or what kind of legal framework they would need. Um, they first have to get past some of the myths maybe around things. Hopefully, um, in the future, we'll be able to use this framework, uh, the concerns-based adoption method, to, to um, start conquering some of these concerns or at least peeling them back as we go. Uh, I think there's some prom promise there in targeting research data education efforts. Um, I'm certainly open to anyone else who's, who's looking in the same realm or has another framework or a different way of thinking about it. I think there's a lot of room in this area to start exploring what is the best way to educate researchers. Um, there's a lot of work on adult education, but not necessarily higher ed adult education from the researcher um, in the research realm. 
And then lastly, I hope I've demonstrated effectively or at least provided a good argument that librarians really have existing skill sets that are quite valuable that help counter this, this sort of resistance that you can run into. Um, and it's things that we do, but maybe we don't know that we do or we can do them a little bit more, a little more explicitly to help conquer research resistance and their, uh, address their concerns. So I am a little bit chatty, so I go a little bit quickly um, through my presentation there. And I'm just going to open it to questions. And I'm, uh, I'm very open to chatting about any or all of uh, what I just presented or anything else. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm imagining that there's going to be quite a number of questions for you from this audience. Um, we'll give everyone maybe a few minutes to be typing their questions into the chat box. Um, everyone can go ahead and enter those questions and we'll be happy to field them for Amanda. Hopefully everyone's fingers are very busy typing their questions right now. All right, we have a question coming in here. Uh, first, any comments on differences or types of approaches that will be used once the different pro profiles are established? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I have no actual evidence to back this up yet, but uh, you could probably catch on that I'm really interested in that hostile non-user profile group. And part of that is because um, as someone who had a decade in, in research prior, I could had I been approached in certain times of my career, I might have responded that way. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that. But uh, I think that, say, if, you, if there were a group of those people gotten together and you just actually laid the cards on the table and was like, you know what, let's get all the negativity out there about this and just have a good session where we're just going to lay all the cards on the table about how it's an administrative burden and it's awful and it's, uh, a new thing and there's been a lot of new things and grant funding is so much more competitive and and kind of get that all out of the way and see that they have that kind of validity to their concerns you know you affirm like this is real genuine emotion we have here okay now we have to like look at it from just the practical standpoint of it's a competitive environment and if you want these research funds you might need to start listening a little bit about what you have to do to get there. Um, so that's kind of sort of the extreme example. I think the easier, much easier profile group um, is the people who just aren't aware. So those eight postdocs who are like indicating that they are unconcerned about research data management. If I had them in a room together or even could send them a link to a tutorial, um, basically say, look, uh, you know, from where you're at, you might not be aware that this is a thing, but it is. And here's your first primer, your your libguide, so to speak, on exploring what you need to do to start thinking about planning to manage your research data. And I feel that my data organization workshops right now are kind of at that awareness level, right? I try and get past that, but when you have an hour to talk about it, you really do start at just the very basics of things. And um, you're not really getting or I don't really get uh, super deep into, you know, how, which particular repository would you choose to share your data and that kind of thing, because that's really for a little bit farther advanced when you are already convinced and already have some basic systems in place. So it's almost like you think about all the information we have in our heads and, you know, when you sit down and consult, uh, I think in an individual cons consultation or in a research lab consultation, I do this internally. I flip through like, oh, they already know about file naming. I don't have to talk to them about that. They've already got like a good folder system set up. Um, they've already got, you know, their legal environment is fine. They're not violating anything. They just need to know about X, Y, Z. What if you could do that on a larger scale? Because you've actually gotten to that by how much they work they've already done themselves. So I don't know if that was specific enough of an answer, but um, that's the exciting part for me, is the ability to kind of scale what I think people are doing at an um, individual or a group level. 
Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, related to the workshop that you teach, the data organization workshop, um, they're wondering what exactly do you teach in that class? It sounds like it could be an interesting train the trainer type of workshop. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, sure, I'd love to. Um, so I've done a, sort of this similar job at three different institutions and my, my pattern is basically when I first show up, I kind of find some researchers to interview, essentially. Um, so I talk to them about what the pain points are around research data, and then from that I put together an organization. Uh, it's, it starts with just basic definition of data, still start most of my workshops that way, because I think that even that word can be confusing. So my personal favorite definition of data, uh, research data, is whatever collection of stuff you do research on. So. I start with the very basic blowing away the myth that data is just numbers or um, that kind of thing. You know, it's whatever collection of stuff that you are doing research on is your research data. I hit the federal stuff a little bit, but because honestly, most of these workshops that I do are cattle call kind of workshops and I can have any different discipline in, in the room. Um, I keep it real simple, talking about sort of the the main five the seven things that go into research data management, um, starting just with uh, basic, you know, uh, d define your data, then we move on to how can you organize it, which is sort of me slipping in metadata as in documentation. And I do that pretty heavily in a file naming convention activity. So it's it's very accessible to almost anyone. It, you know, it, like I said, it's not going to get you from zero to sharing your data in a repository, but it's going to make you aware of all the the top stuff. I will say that it's still about 30 to 40 minutes of lecture. We try and build as much active learning into it, but at this point in time, we found that really challenging. Um, I'm always happy to share my slide decks, by the way, so I, I'd be happy to distribute or share the slide deck from this workshop. It's pretty standard for me at this time. Um, and it's, it gets pretty well received. I have to say, we've, we've gotten, I think the highest attendance we ever had was 76 people, but usually we get 30 or 40 in the room, which I'm pretty pleased with, so. Great, thank you. Uh, another question and comment here. You seem to be emphasizing the grassroots researcher versus working with key stakeholders. Are there internal mandates from the institutional administration and how do these integrate with your process? Oh, gosh. So I'm going to treat that as two different questions. Um, and I'm going to answer the internal mandate one first. So we do have a research data policy at Ohio State. Um, it covers a little bit of this, uh, but it was written, I believe, in 2009. So it had very specific purposes, um, most of which aren't really covered. In fact, it's about half, half about authorship. Um, not so much about, say, keeping your data organized. So I do work with a couple of institutional things like that, and, and I absolutely support them and incorporate them. I think it's really important to have unified messaging across any support entity, um, especially at a place as big as Ohio State. I think researchers really struggle to understand how the different offices are related to each other. Um, they just kind of want to know what they're supposed to do. Um, and, and, and using different language can be confusing and things, so I really try and make sure that the policies are always referred to and kind of broken down to, to something that makes sense for the individual that I'm talking to. Um, the other kind of mandates that I work under that are institutionally oriented tend to be around records management. We have a really strong re records management uh, group on campus, um, and so they've actually been great allies to pull into sort of you know, let's all have similar file naming convention lessons that we talk about. Um, and, and the same with some of the IT groups, you know, they teach a little bit of this stuff too. So there isn't any, so far we have not had a campus-wide group look at research data management in a way that would be um, as comprehensive as I would like. So, so that's not, so I guess those are the mandates I have and maybe I'm not uh, working under some of the more restrictive mandates at, at other institutions. Um, so the first part of that question was empathizing and grassroots versus stakeholders. 
I should clarify a bit that this is just one aspect of how I approach things. So I typically, when people ask me kind of how I do my job, I have two sides of that coin. Um, I intentionally get to know the stakeholders and work with the Office of Research and co-teach, and that is absolutely a better route to getting established, in my opinion, is to go after um, the leaders in, in the field and really pair up with the Office of Research have been wonderful for me um, and, and getting you in in front of researchers. Uh, the grassroots approach, so I kind of say what I do is what I call triage, which means if you show up in my office or my office hours, I will attempt to answer any question you have and get you where you need to go, right? So just sort of get that data management plan that's written or, or whatnot. And then I collectively take all those experiences and I try and push them up in a kind of advocacy way to the stakeholders that I also work with. So, um, so I hope that's a more balanced answer than maybe what the presentation, the impression the presentation gave, because I would actually say if you're, if you're new to this, go find the stakeholders in the Office of Research or um, the IT groups tend to be really great places to start. Wonderful, thanks Amanda. Uh, we've had a really great question about, have you experienced resistance to data management changes from librarians or perhaps skepticism is a better description than resistance? If so, how did, did you approach it the same way that you approach that resistance with researchers and did it help? That is a fabulous question, and I realized um, that I, I should have put the word researcher another time in my title. <laughs> um, so uh, the short answer is yes, I have experienced resistance from librarians to the topic um, or skepticism or, or however you want to um, sort of call it. Um, I have not attempted to approach that in this way. I think that it may have worked. <laughs> um, it didn't occur to me. Basically, I didn't know about it at the time when I first started approaching that. I, I think the skepticism or the resistance I find from researchers um, often has a different root, or I, I believe it has a different root, either in having lost positions and um, or, or sort of uh, in general about the librarian profession where we kind of have many, at least my experience is that we have fewer people and the work doesn't go down. Right? So adding another expectation onto a 40-hour work week or a 60-hour work week seems to be um, a bit unrealistic. Uh, and, and sometimes that's how data can be represented. Um, certainly I try never to represent it that way. Um, in fact, I have some standard language when I work with other librarians is basically I'll, I'll work with you as much as you'd like me to. Um, if, you know, a subject librarian firmly believes that their people do not need this information, I'll go with that. They're the experts in that field and they could be very right in, in the way that they're looking at it. Um, I, you know, looking back on my short career here, it might have been more valuable if I had approached it more the way that I'm approaching researchers um, and attempted to sort of peel that onion back and get down to what the root concerns were. Um, I don't know. I guess I, I don't know if that approach would work or not, but if anyone tries it, I'd love to hear how it works out for them. Great, thanks for that answer, Amanda. Uh, Amanda, I'm gonna ask if you would move on to the last page of your slides. Um, certainly, we still have time, time for questions, so if anyone has one, please feel free to ask, put it in the chat box. But I wanted to point out that Amanda has shared her email address, so if anyone does have a question that's not answered, and I know a couple of people, Amanda, have asked about some specific activities like your file naming convention activity um, sure. and where they can find that link. And I bet the best way would be to email you, is that correct? Absolutely. In fact, we just got some libguides up and going. I don't think they're um, indexed yet, but I have a short code where I could probably just send that out. and. Um, you can pull up some of this information from, we're attempting to shift our workshops from teaching from PowerPoint to teaching directly from a LibGuide. Um, so hopefully we're gonna have all of that loaded up into these LibGuides soon and then you can kind of bookmark it and go back for it. But uh, I'm always willing to share. Um, I think in general in our field, um, we share a lot. Great. 
So I'm not seeing any other questions right now in the chat. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up for today. And if anyone does have a question, please feel free to reach out to Amanda. Amanda, again, I want to thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for joining us today. This was really a, a great talk, and I thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. And I'd really um, encourage anyone who's interested in this topic, please reach out. I think a lot of us in this field are we're super friendly and we're very, very welcoming. So. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for today. I do ask that everyone stay on, logged on just a few more moments. We have some final housekeeping to go over.